as long as you work hard, you do you, know, you do your best and you never give up. I, I think you're setting yourself up for success in whatever it looks like. joined right now by Justin Herbert, my man Patrick. We're doing an official introduction here. In my eyes, the best quarterback in the NFL. Yes. Oh, I really appreciate that, Drew, but uh, it's, I think it's a lot more, of work to be done. More of an honor to be on your show, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here. You're certainly uh, helping me out by doing this, but I'm excited to chat. Uh, I'm bummed, the listeners. We were just talking about Pat McAfee and how awesome he was. And how poor my intros are relative to Pat. Pat really does a stellar job. Yeah, but he's had he's had a few years of experience. You'll get there. Yeah, hopefully I can just get the crowd riled up and excited for our guests. Yeah. Um, all right, getting back to the Twitter and Instagram thing. So in high school, was it something that bothered you? And so you're like, I'm going to delete it because of that? I thought it was great in high school because there was no there was no really attention on it. And it was just like me, my friends, my, my family, you'd post a picture and, you know, your yeah. cl classmates would, would like it and um, things like that. But as soon as I got to college, there was a little more attention and I didn't really want that. And, and kind of, like I said, um, you know, it was actually my freshman year and people started tagging me in these like start Justin Herbert. Like I was the backup at the time and I didn't want mm -hmm. any attention. I just wanted to do my job um, and get along with it. But people started tagging me in that and, um, you know, I didn't really know how to deal with it, so I just deleted everything and, and said, you know, I don't need this. I don't need Twitter. I don't need any of it. I'll just do my job and play football. So you were just trying to scroll and, and catch your friends, catch your family, and you were just seeing this stuff, and it, mm -hmm. it bothered you, or was it kind of like – how did it make you feel? I didn't, were you like, yeah, they should start me? No, I didn't want to be in the limelight. Like, I didn't want any extra attention. Like, playing football is one thing, and being out on the field, I think that's great. But, like, anything outside of that in the spotlight, I, I try to avoid. And – um I just wanted to see, you know, keep up with my friends, family. And I was getting tagged in these, like, start Justin Herbert. And I didn't want any controversy. I didn't want to start anything because the guy in front of me, I, I respected him as a teammate, as a player, as a friend. Um, and I didn't want any part of that. I actually, tr I think I trained with him uh, at Pro Code this last offseason. Mm -hmm. He's a really cool guy. Yeah, Dakota's awesome. He played at uh, Montana State with my older brother. And so I was friends with him before. And it was just kind of a tough. Yeah. I don't know. It's, 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 yeah. The way he described it to me, he said, you guys were just struggling with the season. Yeah. And th they were like, let's just, let's try out Justin. Yeah. I feel like that's typically how it goes in football. Yeah. So we, we weren't, uh, we didn't finish the way we wanted to my freshman year. I think we went four and eight. And so it was a tough year. Coach got fired. Um, but, uh, it was interesting to go through for sure. Wait. So before I like, we talk about your upbringing with not liking the limelight, how have you, like mentally processed the last two years. Cause it's one thing to like be elite in college, mm -hmm. but I mean, being your teammate, I've seen like the chargers just kind of like push you out there. The NFL kind of push you out there. And there's obviously a lot of attention when you're rookie of the year and an elite quarterback. How have you like mentally processed that? Yeah. I think one of the things that we're guys on our team are, are, are doing a good job of is like filtering what's important and what's not whatever's being said on social media, on Twitter, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really have any pertinence to what's going on. And um, if it's not coming from, you know, a teammate, a coach, my family, I, I don't put too much effort into it and I don't really pay attention to it. And, um, you know, thousands of things are being said on the news. And if you start getting caught up in that and you start worrying about that, I think you're already losing your job. Um, and so it's important for me to just focus on football, play football. And if it's not coming from Shane Day, Joe Lombardi, Chase, Easton, or one of you guys, I'm not going to pay too much attention to it. But what about like the like the marketing, like deals, and and the NFL mm -hmm. wanting you to do all of these interviews? I feel like it would be natural to feel like you're a big deal. I don't know. I, I think as long as I'm genuine in myself, I think that makes it easy. Um, you know, you talk about these deals like Nike, and um, you know, you look at like Chipotle and, and things like this those are products that I've grown up using yeah. and like Nike being from Oregon, it doesn't get any better than that. And, um, you know, they were kind of late to getting a deal with me, but I, I told everyone, I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not going any other way. Like Nike's I've always been Nike and it's going to be genuine. It's going to be myself. And, 
um, whatever happens, happens, but I, I'm going to stick with them. In terms of like going out in public, has that been like more of a challenge? Have you felt yourself like staying at home more? What's that? Like for you, I feel like I get it a little bit if I go back to like yeah. Fort Wayne or South Bend where I'm from and I can like, whether it's like church on Sunday and I'm like, ah, like, I, you know, I'd rather just watch it from home type deal. Like, how do you like handle that? How have you, has that like changed <laughs> your day to day? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's kind of like a tough, because I love just going and hanging out with my friends. Like if you go sit down at a restaurant and, and eat food, like I love just hanging out with them and talking with them and. Um, so I know we went and we went and drove those, uh, K one yeah, go cars. Yeah. That things was, like, that was awesome. Things like that. Um, but at the same time, you always have to kind of worry about, you know, cameras, social media and people taking clips and whatever you say out in public, you have to be careful because everything is so connected now. And, um, I, I think it has been tough because you want to enjoy, you know, these years of your life of, of being young and being able to do things. But at the same time, you have to be responsible and, um, respectful, respectful of other people. Yeah, Patrick, do you need him to move any closer to the mic? I feel like it's cutting out a little bit. Yeah, just, just stay closer, please. Sorry. Yeah. Come closer. More intimate with the mic, Justin. All right. Uh, is that how you've always been? Like more out of the limelight? Or was that something your parents taught you, your dad showed you? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, think, I feel like it's just kind of always been like that. I grew up uh, playing for a high school coach that was always – Best, one of the best coaches I've ever had, Coach Johnson, Coach Jay. And, uh, you know, it was always about the team. And we never really went to these camps uh, that you see, like the the opening and the Elite 11, things like that. Um, I was playing basketball and baseball at the same time, so I didn't have time to go to these camps. And um, it was all about winning for, for our high school. And growing up and being a part of that team, it wasn't about any individual. It wasn't about getting recruited and seeing how far you could go. It was about giving yourself to something bigger than yourself and – for the team to win and do all these great things that you have to give up and you have to make sacrifices. But did you not have like any personal ambitions for like getting scholarships? No, not, not in Eugene. We had uh, maybe a couple guys that we know. Curtis White went and played at Oregon. He was a scholarship guy. Um, you know, you can name a couple, a couple guys before us that really went on and played. And, you know, Alex Brink and Chris Miller, these are quarterbacks that played well before me, but uh, they're guys that you knew that, that went on and played it, whether it was Washington state or Oregon. Um, that was, those are kind of the stories you heard, but nothing more, more than that. So a lot of the guys at Oregon, they were from out of state. Yeah. So not a, not a whole lot of guys from our high school went and played um, division one football. You know, you get these exceptions, my older brother and um, you get Connor Strom and these guys that really, you know, were exceptional players, but uh, I never really had any goals of going on to play and because I didn't really think I was going to. So I was just expecting, you know, to play baseball, basketball, football in high school and, and go get a real job after that. That's so funny. I, so my high school in Fort Wayne, it wasn't known for like sports at all. It was a very like academic, <laughs> like driven high school. And they were very, very good, like academically, like had a good placement deal. They had a good basketball team and a baseball team. The baseball team actually won state, I think, one or two times during like the few years I was there and, and the years before. But like football really, really struggled. And so I got involved with like a performance training place yeah. where I started going to like all these camps and that's how I got recruited. Mm -hmm. So for you, if you weren't going to these camps, what was recruitment like for you? Um, there wasn't much. You know, I, uh, my first scholarship offer was from Northern Arizona. Um, and one of the coaches actually went to Sheldon high school, which is where I went. So we kind of had that connection that way. Uh -huh. Um, and then the next one was Portland state, which was two hours North of me. And then another one was Montana state where my older brother played. And so those are the three schools. And then Oregon finally came around. And so I, I, I told them, yeah, I, I'm in. And I didn't really have to think too much about that one. I was, uh, reading did you, you broke your leg your junior year? Yep, my femur. So were all those offers before your leg? Uh, all of them were after. Oh, they were after? Yeah. So I started my junior year. That was the first year I played varsity football. Um, broke it in the third game, so I didn't get to play for the rest of the year. And then my senior year got, I think, all of those offers. Were you, like, as big as you are now then, or were you just, like, a, a late grower? 
Um, my sophomore year, I was probably six three, and then my junior year, I, I was probably six five, six six. Okay. Was football your favorite sport at that time? It was actually baseball. Was it really? Yeah. So I thought I was going to be a baseball player. Growing up, um, I was a pitcher, played shortstop, and then I grew a little bit, and ground balls started going between my legs, so they had to move me from shortstop. But you were a good pitcher. I like to think I used to be able to throw the ball pretty hard. Um, I don't know. What were you throwing? Like low nineties? Yeah, I don't know. I I heard multiple things. I don't know. I never got got to see the gun myself, but uh, I feel like I could throw it. So baseball was my first love too. Oh really? I played. Yeah, I played center field, and grew up. Everybody would. Everybody told me like you're a great baseball player. They were like. Your brother's a little bit better of a football <laughs> player. And so in my mind, I was like, I, I want to play pro baseball. Yeah. And like in high school, I was like, I just don't know if I can give up football. And I started getting some offers. Did you have any offers to play baseball or did you get drafted? No, I never did. Um, I think by the time I kind of got better at baseball in high school, um, football had kind of already been established. And I think uh, late my junior year, senior year, I, I committed so it was kind of like I'm playing football, and I think everything else kind of backed off. Okay. All right, backing up a little bit. Uh, you were so born and raised in Eugene. Mm-hmm. And does your family still, like, live in the same spot yeah. that you grew so up in? We're about a mile away from the stadium. Um, and so we grew up, you know, Oregon fans. My grandpa, uh, he played there in the 60s, early 60s, and so we were always big Oregon fans. And so we'd watch the games, and we'd end up walking home just because traffic was so bad and – it was probably a 10, 15 minute walk. Um, and so I just remember going to the games with my grandfather, my brother and my dad. And we went for probably eight or 10 years. Um, and then I started playing there. So they kept the season tickets and everyone kept watching. And you were one of three boys. Yep. The middle okay. of three. And were, was sports just kind of with the stadium being there? Did your, your parents played sport? Like, was that just something that was always, yeah, it was very competitive. It was kind of brutal. Uh, my Give older us a brother, little insight into some family competition. So we played every, We played soccer, basketball, baseball, football. Um, my older brother, he ended up playing at Montana State as a receiver. Mm-hmm. Um, but I spent my childhood trying to beat him just because he was my older brother, and he would, he'd, he'd beat me in basketball, baseball. It doesn't matter. Like what it, How many it years was. older? Two years older. Okay. And so – we were very competitive and I think he would, he's kind of the guy that made me into like how competitive I am today is because of him. Cause I tried to spend all these years trying to beat him. And I think I finally remember beating him in baseball. Somehow we played one-on-one like T-ball or something like that. And I know I beat him and I remember that. And that was the first time I ever beat him. And I, I think I, that was kind of a moment that I, I still kind of think about. And I don't know if I've talked to him about it, but uh, it got very competitive. So I have a brother that's 16 months younger than me Mm -hmm. and we were like super close, but also like really competitive. Were you guys feisty, like fighting? Like, yeah, it it wasn't always like super nice. Um, we, we kind of got at it and and we'd play football in the front yard and we'd play tackle football sometimes and things got physical, but, um, you know, it made us better and we've got so much respect for each other now. And I think that's the greatest part is, you know, we grew up in pushing each other and we competed and we all made each other better. But now we're kind of able to look back and say, you know, I, I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful that you guys pushed me because I'm the player that I am today because of you. Um, and so I wouldn't have been there without them. How does that ultra like competitiveness, how does that like manifest itself like mentally with you now? Like, do you, does it like, obviously like, does it bother you a lot? Like, when you would lose just like really small things, whether it was like mm-hmm. a game of cards or was it really only the things that mattered or was it kind of everything? I think it's great because I think it's everything, whether it's yeah. Madden or whether it's golfing, um, even lifting at the facility. Like there are always times where you're pushing each other and you know, we've got a pretty close group of friends and whenever you compete with them, like you want to, you want to beat them and you want to, you want to embarrass them. And yeah. so that's kind of my goal. Whenever we go golfing and whenever we go, you know, whenever we go race go-karts, you want to win and you don't want, you never want to get second place. So that's kind of the fun part about it. When did the golf introduce itself? I grew up playing with my older brother, um, just kind of for fun. And my grandpa was a a big golfer as well. So we kind of always went with my family and kind of just grew up playing, joking 
it, it wasn't very serious and, and until maybe college when you kind of had more time to actually go play and um, you kind of enjoy playing in these nicer places and especially the past two years with all the guys that we have golfing on our team um, it, it definitely has, has kind of grown into something these past few years is Eugene known for for its golfing I don't know if it's known. What's, for you, what's Eugene like known for? Is it like Oregon football? Rain, yeah, yeah. rain probably. Uh, Oregon football for three fourths of the year, it's going to be raining. Um, and I, honestly, I love that. It's 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 really nice. June, July, and August, um, you get all four seasons, and and that's kind of the part I miss about Oregon and California is it's always sunny, and you never really get the rain, you never get the snow or anything like that. But uh, Eugene was pretty cool. <laughs> you just said. Yeah, it rains like seventy five percent of the year. It's great. I mean, that's it's, unique, it's green. dude. It's that's really unique. green. Yeah, like the Northwest is is awesome. You go hiking, fishing. Um, you can get all. You can get everything out there. So you enjoy the rain. I think it's nice. I mean, it's, I, it's just kind of what I grew up in. So used to it by now. Gosh, that's what. So moving out here, I moved from Indiana, like the Midwest, yeah. and it's very like bipolar. Like it can be like blizzarding one day and then the next day it's like 50 or 60 degrees. It's like, what is going on? The sunshine is like the thing I enjoy most yeah. about Southern California. It is really nice. You never really have to worry about the rain. You can like, golf you can year go, round. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. <laughs> that's the biggest thing. Like in January and February when you're, when you're going out to practice, like it's still 70 degrees. So you don't have to worry about putting hand warmers on, except we did have a couple of weeks where it was pretty brutal, but that's fine. Yeah, I remember one. I don't know which team we were playing, but it was a brutal. It was late, yeah, it was the Thursday night week, wasn't it? Might have been. We were outside. It was like pouring down rain. One of the ten days that it rains here yep. in Southern California, and it was like forty degrees. Some guys were upset about it. I I was like, this is uh, this is like, I don't know, youth football. Yeah, and I was I was back. trying to be tough too. Like I didn't wear any sleeves or any um, like comp- compression tights or whatever and so i just went out in shorts and a t-shirt and that was a big mistake you regret it yeah i I was really cold um but i think it was cool that i went out there and kind of toughed it up so i tried to send a message there you go what uh what were your like parents like growing up were they like pretty strict or kind of just let you guys do what you want like what was that i think they were the right amount of being strict like Obviously, they didn't let us just go out and be irresponsible whenever we wanted to, but they always gave us the opportunity to kind of learn for ourselves. And, um, you know, my older brother did a great job of kind of showing us the way, and he did a really good job in school. He was very responsible, never got in any trouble. And so we kind of, my younger brother and I, we kind of looked at that and, you know, we said, like, we kind of want to be like him. And so our parents kind of gave us that platform of growing and developing and making mistakes and learning from them and and obviously not punishing us too hard because, um, you know, that I, I think that could probably do more harm than good. But uh, to have that guy, the leader of our house, Mitchell, my older brother, uh, was definitely a good influence on us. I feel like you've talked a lot about your older brother. How much younger is your younger brother than you? You, you guys played together, right? Two years. Yeah, so he's at Oregon right now. He plays tight end. Um, okay. And so didn't get to throw him any touchdown passes in college, but uh, got to throw him one in high school, which was pretty cool. That's so rad. What? Uh, so what? I guess let's fast forward a little bit to Oregon. Was that a place you grew up a fan? Like, was that where you wanted to go? Like when they offered it kind of sealed the deal or because I feel like breaking your leg, I don't know for you, but for my brother, like when he tore his ACL going into senior season, like it really kind of halted his recruiting. And I think it does for like a lot of high school athletes, you know, they go through something and teams kind of become disinterested. Was that, a little bit like your case, like you played really, I don't know. You said you weren't going to camps or anything like when they offered, what did it seal mm-hmm. the deal for you? Yeah. I, when they offered, I, I was on board uh, immediately. Uh, I remember coach Helfrich called me and, um, you know, he said, we're going to offer you a scholarship. And I said, great. Like I'm in. And, and like, that was that. Um, but I did actually go to one camp. I went to a Washington Husky football camp and that was, um, maybe a week after I got the screws taken out of my knee I had surgery to, to repair the, the femur and then got the screws taken out. So I went to one camp and was hobbling on one leg. And I told him like, I'm going to do my best effort, but like I'm on one leg. And, and so I never heard back from them. And then Oregon ended up coming around and I said, yeah, I'm in, I'm in for Oregon. So it was, 
kind of glad that the way things worked out. I feel like you're such a simple, like content. You're like, yeah, I'm good. Is that how you are about most things? Well, I feel you. like most people that. like weigh the options. Yeah. Like they're like, well, Oregon came around, like, you know, maybe some other schools are coming around. Like, I don't know, dude. I didn't really think a whole lot about it. And I think in the long run, it, it worked out really well, but maybe I probably should have spent more time thinking about, you know, my future. Um, but I just played football. I played basketball and baseball and whatever happened was, was going to happen. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that it worked out. It might've gone a different way if I, you know, if I thought more about it, but, uh, I don't know, it just kind of worked out and, and, and didn't really worry about it. I, I didn't spend too much time, you know, panicking or, or worrying that what, what if I don't make it? And I always had a plan is I was going to go, you know, study biology, do what my dad did, try and be a doctor, do these things. Um, but, uh, Glad, really glad football worked out. So was it that fallback plan that kind of gave you the comfort of like, I'm playing with the house, house money right now? It was never really a, like a, a fallback plan. It was like, that was the plan. And if football works out great, um, going to school, I, you know, I, I worked really hard in, in college and I don't think I'm naturally very smart, but I had to work really hard. Like I had to study and I, you know, I didn't really watch too much TV. I didn't really play a whole lot of video games in college. Um, but school worked out. And so like I went through school and I had a plan and then football ended up working out. And, and so that, I thought that was the, the greatest thing is, um, you know, I wasn't worried. I always had something to do and whether football worked out or whether it didn't, you know, I was going to go do something. And, and I think that was the most important thing. But what for you, what, how do you handle it when thing like when it doesn't go according to plan, has there ever been a moment in your life where like, let's say your plan was to go, mm-hmm following your dad's footsteps, be a doctor. Like if that wouldn't have worked out, is there ever a moment where like you had a plan and it didn't work out and you had to. Um, not yet. Um, you know, I, I think that's, well, and one thing too, I, I have to, I probably have to correct it. My dad, he was a biology major. He wasn't the doctor. My uncle was the doctor. Okay. Um, but he was a biology major and, and we kind of always grew up, you know, studying animals, doing all those fun things. But, uh, I guess everything's kind of worked out so far. And I, I think as long as I'm not worrying and I'm not trying to force anything, I don't think it really can go wrong. As long as you work hard, you do, you know, you do your best and you never give up. I, I think you're setting yourself up for success and whatever it looks like. You mentioned one thing that I'll take away from this conversation. It's like, you didn't think a lot about it. I, I feel like I struggle over analyzing and overthinking mm-hmm. a lot of things. I imagine there's just some freedom with just, taking it as it comes and not thinking too much about it. What, uh, I guess fast forwarding to your time at Oregon, other than like teammates, is there anything like you really like miss about college football? Yeah. Um, I mean, you probably said it like the teammates and and always being around those guys. And, um, I think that's what makes college football so special is like you're all in it together. And, and now in the NFL, everyone's got their own families. They live in their own places and you're kind of separated outside of football like yeah. the facility is the greatest part because everyone's lockers are right next to each other and you have to talk with each other and I, I think that type of camaraderie is like is the greatest because I mean I, you get to hang out with your friends and play football all day and it doesn't get any better than that and I think that's what made college football so great is like you get to live with these guys you get to go play football with them you get to wake up and camp was was horrible like 10 or 12 hours of football was was tough but at least you were in it together and that's what I miss the most is like you, you, you have these great relationships with, with these guys and, and now you're kind of off on your own and, and now you got to build new ones. But uh, college football is great. Yeah. You get it in the NFL, you get the locker room camaraderie, but then guys like go home and they have families. Yeah. And the unique element about college football was, I mean, you're probably going back to an apartment with, with one of your teammates. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's tough too, because in the NFL, like, guys come and go and there's a lot of turnover and the guy that's on your team last year might not be on it this year. And you have to kind of, you know, manage your expectations of, you know, you're not going to be here forever and you're not going to be able to, it's not like college where you've got these four years and you know, all right, I'm going to be with these guys for four years. So it's kind of tough like that. When you got to Oregon, you said you weren't starting initially. Dakota was Mm -hmm. starting. What was, how did you, I guess, what were your expectations going in? I had none. I, uh, 
I, I showed up as the sixth string quarterback, was just happy to be on the team because like Oregon, I, I get to go play for Oregon and I get to play quarterback and it doesn't happen too often. So I, I went there and was, was literally just trying to do my best to study the playbook, learn everything, get to know all the guys, earn their trust. Um, and I remember sitting down with my quarterback coach at the end of fall camp and he says, you're going to be the, the second string quarterback. And I remember asking him, like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> like you want me to be the backup quarterback? Because I, like, I really didn't worry about anything. I was just, I just went and played football. And next thing you know. But I, did you like, not think you were worthy of being the second string? No, I had no idea. I had just went and, like, I had no clue of, you know, I, I thought all these other guys were, were so great. And you look at all the highs, like, the rankings and the camps, and you think, oh, the, all these guys are so much better than me. And so, I came. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and, and didn't really have a whole lot of expectations. I was just happy to be there. And next thing you know, I was the backup quarterback and and playing in the first game. And uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. I get to run out on the field, you know, the field that I grew up watching, and now I'm running through the tunnel. My parents are out in the stands, and I remember looking up and seeing them. I know exactly where they're sitting. So I thought that was really cool. But how do you balance that humility with – like the confidence I feel like you need as an NFL player, yeah. as a college player, like believing you're the best and you should be out there and you're going to dominate. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that I've kind of had to learn the past couple of years. Um, I had a great conversation with Coach Staley about it because he told me, he's like, you can't owe shucks your way through it. Like, you know, you can't be like just happy to be here. Like, you got to go compete. And, and, and there's the competition part of football that I love that, I just want to win and it doesn't matter what, like whatever we're doing. And, and now we're to the point of like, I know that I can throw the ball. I know I can do these things. And now I've got these expectations of, well, just go out and play football Like go do what you know you, you can do and good things will happen. And, um, you know, I think I can always become a better leader. And, you know, I, I think there are ways of going about it, being yourself, being genuine. And just like you, like, you're not a, you're not fake. Like you, you're, you're you and guys respect that. They, they respond to that and that's what they need in the leader. And I, I think it's really easy to just go be a rah, rah guy when things are good, but when things are bad and you, when you're down and you go into the huddle and the same thing, or when the bullets are flying and saying, Hey guys, we're fine. Like we've been here before. We know exactly what we're going to do. We know how to get out of this. I think that's the most important part. So you get told you're going to be the second string uh, quarterback and you're like, shoot, <laughs> you sure coach? Sure. Sign me up. Uh, that was, Going into your sophomore season, freshman year, my true. Freshman. So after camp, yeah. So you, so I was. So there. you had, must have had a good camp. I showed up uh, in June, and that was probably maybe July or August. So you didn't get any sense at all during camp that you're outperforming the other guys. No, I. I mean, you're not blind. There you're were watching the tape. There were signs like they started giving me some one reps, and I probably should have known that, like that was a good sign. You I did know. But I really didn't. I, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. I was just like, you know what? Sh shoot, I get to throw to these these really fast guys. So that's that's got to be fun. You get you gotta know. Like when I when I you would think you'd think, dude, you're one of the more interesting guys, and I love it uh, <laughs> that I know. So your second string, and then did you end up starting your your freshman year, or was that yeah like, probably game four or five? Okay, and then. You played four years? Four years at Oregon. Could you have come out after your third year? Mm -hmm. So what kind of led to your decision to come back? I went through the same thing, but I was uh, coming, deciding whether or not to come back for my fifth season. Yeah. Because I had had a couple injuries and uh, had a red shirt. What was kind of the deciding factor for you? I feel like, did you even consider coming out? <laughs> okay, so this is going to sound crazy, but I... I grew up like obviously dreaming about playing for the Ducks, right? And so Oregon has had multiple guys leave early for the draft. And I always grew up thinking if I'm ever in this position, I'm going to come back. Like for the team, like whatever it is, I'll be around all four years. Like I'm not, I'm not thinking of myself before, but, and obviously it's a tough situation. Like it is life changing to, to leave early and do all those great things. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I knew for me personally, I was coming back regardless. And so I always thought it was going to be funny if people were kind of like making it a, a big deal. Like, oh, is he going to leave or is he going to come back? And I just always kind of wanted to just show up and not say anything and just be like, yeah, like, where did you guys think I was going to go? 
like I'm here for my fourth year, but uh, I ended up saying like, you know, I'm coming back and um, talked with my family about it briefly, but uh, I was always going to come back. So when the agents came knocking, you were just like, hold the brakes or pump the brakes guys. Yeah. I actually coming back. I told my parents to, to handle all that. So I didn't talk to any agents until after my senior year was done. Wow. So was there a, was there a Wolf of Wall Street moment? I'm coming back. <laughs> No, not really. I th- I think uh, Oregon, maybe on Twitter or Instagram, probably announced it. But uh, at the time, I didn't have one. So I, it wasn't for me. Gosh. What was uh, what was your best memory during your four years? There Was there a game or did you have a spot on campus yeah. that was like a go-to spot if, you know, things were going bad to kind of... My, I think our greatest memory at Oregon was probably winning the Rose Bowl, especially having started four and eight my freshman year because, you know, we, we coach got fired, a bunch of guys left, you go four and eight and Oregon never really went four and eight during that time period. Cause Oregon was, you know, in the national championship in the Rose Bowl, Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. Um, and so that was obviously, obviously really tough to go four and eight, but, uh, to climb back, to go seven and five the next year, nine and four, and then to go 12 and two, win the Rose Bowl, um, you know, I thought that was huge for us to kind of battle and, and fight our way through. What do you think the future is for the the Pac-12? I've always thought really highly of the Pac-12. You know, I think it's at its best when Oregon, USC, Washington are, are at their best. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, how USC comes back with, um, with their new coach and Oregon got a new coach and, you know, a lot's changing in the Pac-12, but I think the football is really good and, um, you know, I'm proud to, to have come from the Pac-12 because I think yeah. really highly of it. I think very highly of Notre Dame, and we don't have a conference. Yeah. Well, if you want to join the Pac-12. <laughs> We're not going to join the Pac-12. I think uh, the Pac-12 honestly has an issue with the time they play their games. Yeah. I think it's hard for young kids who aren't staying up to, like, become fans of the Pac-12. And so I feel like it really sometimes limits the recruiting options to, like, West Coast kids. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you guys need to negotiate some terms with ABC and ESPN for a little earlier. I think it is cool though, because you do get some night games at, at Austin stadium and like the lights are obviously really cool. And you always dream about playing under the lights and, and a big football stadium. So to to be able to do that in the Pac 12, I think that's pretty cool though. So you're, you had no expectations going to Oregon, but coming out as a senior, you obviously were being projected as a, as a first round draft pick. What were your expectations then? Um, I heard a whole lot. You know, you know, you always hear about the leadership qualities of, you know, could I lead? Could I do all these things? I have accuracy issues. Um, you know, I'm not a real competitor, things like that. And so I had a, a great chance at the Senior Bowl, at the Combine. Where did you hear those things if you didn't have social media? That was just from coaches and from, like, agents. And you go to these interviews and they, they ask you about that. And, um, you know, I remember a bunch of inter- interviews of, people pulling up film and being like, you know what happened on this play? And I'd say, well, you know, maybe my mechanics weren't as good as, you know, I thought they were. And, and I've spent a lot of time fixing that. And um, I had that opportunity to, to answer those questions and to be real with everyone and, and tell them, you know, this is who I really am. Yeah, I only had one sit-down interview at the NFL Combine, and it was with the Bengals. They asked me to do the like, most random stuff. Yeah, They said, if I need... They were giving me like math problems. They were like, if I need 57 cents and I can only have five coins, what coins do I need? And I probably spent two minutes. Like I was like, no guys, I'm going to figure this out. And that's probably where I lost my, my potential to be taken by them. They're like, this guy's going to be out there thinking way too hard. We're not drafting him. Yeah, no, there, there have been some really interesting questions. Like I was asked by a team who I'd want to punch more out of everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, And you really can't say like, oh, I wouldn't punch anyone because they're going to force you. They're going to think you're like, passive hey, like, and they're going to be like, we need an answer. And I'd be like, all right, I'll, I'll punch this guy. But, uh, <laughs> who, who did you decide to punch? <laughs> um, it was actually the quarterback coach. Cause I had the best relationship with him. And so I knew that he'd understand if I said to him, like, I, I feel like we'd be able to move past that. So what were those overall? What was your, uh, I guess, NFL pre-draft process experience? Like, was, it was a lot of fun. I, I actually, where'd you train? I trained down, you're not going to believe this, probably five minutes away from our facility. 
Um, really? So down in Costa Mesa, um, like kind of like by Santa Ana as well. We, we trained at proactive this, this gym together for athletes first. And so sure. we had a bunch of guys that I still talk to that are still in the NFL that are, are playing. And, you know, we had a great group of guys that kind of went through everything together. So like we went to the senior bowl, went to the combine together. And so we were all kind of miserable together because those are obviously really tough weeks. Um, but to have those guys and to be able to, to, you know, stay with them, hang out with them, play football, lift, do all those fun things. Uh, I really enjoy the process. So when you were competing, who were the top quarterbacks in your class? Yep. It was you were, uh, two of Joe Burrow, Tua, and Jordan Love. Okay, so when you're competing against those guys to potentially be taken ahead and be slotted ahead, Mm -hmm. how did you handle, you obviously, that competitive side of you, how did you handle the pressure of like needing to perform well at the Senior Bowl, or did you not even think about it? Yeah, I I kind of took a different approach to it. I kind of understood that I'm not really competing against those guys, I'm I'm competing against myself, and I just wanted to go to a good team that, you know, felt like they believed in me and it didn't really matter, you know, whether I thought I was better than one of the quarterbacks or not. It, it, it didn't come down to that. And I didn't really have a whole lot of say in where I went or, you know, when I went, but uh, to have the chargers believe in me, draft me, um, you know, I, I don't think it could have worked out any better. And whether it was first or whether it was 31st or whether it was 250th it, in the long run, it didn't really matter to me. Yeah, I feel like that is the that's the right I feel like that's the right answer and I feel like that's the answer guys have to remind themselves about, but mm-hmm. I feel like human instinct is to worry, yeah. you know, about or to like I don't know, desire a certain outcome and like think about that outcome. I don't know. Do you do like visualization or anything? in preparation for games or? Um, I don't know if I would say like, you know, I do it. I think it just come kind of comes naturally and whether I, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about the game the night before. And when you go to bed, you think about all the, all the things that you're going to be able to do. And you think about the plays and what it's going to look like. And you just kind of remind yourself of the game plan. And um, obviously I think if you think good things are going to happen, they're more likely to happen. And uh, I think that's just kind of one of those things that you kind of, do naturally growing up and playing and competing and, and having all these different sports that you play. I think it just comes naturally. The night before the game, were there are there ever instances where you have to battle negative thoughts? Like maybe it was a, a that, you know, the week after a bad game, or maybe you didn't have the best week of practice. Mm-hmm. Are there ever times where I don't know, yeah, negative plays or thoughts? I think probably the toughest part is, is probably during the game. Um, I think during the week of preparation, you're so busy that you don't really have a whole lot of time to worry about what happened last week is you got to get ready for this next opponent. But during the game, like if you throw an interception, you go to the sideline, like obviously you feel horrible. Like I never want to send the defense. I never want to send you guys back out on the field. Yeah. I want to, I want to go score, you know, take some time, kick a PAT, kick off, then send you guys out. Um, but if, you know, if you throw an interception or you have to punt and you, you run off to the sideline, it is kind of tough. It is, you know, you have to think about that. And, um, you know, I think one of the great things about our team is you've got Shane Day, our quarterback coach, Easton Stig, Chase Daniel. They're all right there. And, and they're able to kind of take you out and support you and say, you know what, hey, we're fine. We're going to go do it the next drive. And football, there's a lot of time left. As long as you've got downs and time on the clock, you're in a position to win. Yeah, but personally, do you not get ticked off after a bad play, like your inner competitiveness? I think I get probably more upset in practice. Because I want to throw every single pass perfect. I want I want practice to be perfect. And so if I overthrow a guy, like I'll feel horrible. And it kind of, it is one of those things that I've had to get better at getting over that. And just saying, you know what, like that's not me. I'll be better the next time. I'll have another rep to, to make a better throw. Um, but I think in college that kind of affected me is if it wasn't perfect, I'd, it'd kind of get me down for the rest of practice. But uh, it's definitely something I've worked on. Yeah, we had a sports psychologist, uh, Dr. Amber Selking at Notre Dame, and mm-hmm. she would she called it like power statements. Like, uh, she used the example. I think it was of the Rays uh, center fielder, and I'm blank, Kevin Kiermaier, and he's actually from Fort Wayne. Shout mm-hmm. out to Fort Wayne, and he he had this uh, technique where he would step in the batter's box, and let's say he swung and missed or something, he would step out 
and he had a spot on like the left, like upright, not the upright. What's yeah, it called the, the, in baseball? I don't know the foul pole line. The foul pole. Foul pole. There it is, the foul pole. And he would look down at the foul pole, and he would like take a breath and like step back in. She said something like that, or like you were saying, like, "Hey, that's not me. I'll be better next time." Yeah. Like those power statements uh, can be huge, for sure. Did you guys do a whole bunch of like uh, mindset training like that? It was interesting. So we we went four and eight my junior year. We were like, we were bad my freshman year. My sophomore year, we went to the <laughs> Fiesta Bowl, got smashed by Ohio State. Yep. We had uh, we had like Jalen Smith, Will Fuller. Uh, we had a lot like Romeo Cora. We had a lot of really good players. And then my junior year, we went four and eight horrible and similar to you guys had like a whole our head coach did basically a whole shift on the staff brought a new strength coach brought in dietitian nutritionist uh offensive defensive coordinator basically full revamp and part of the new addition to the team was like a sports psych and i don't know if he was working individually with her like prior just like for his own like mental like sharpness but she ended up working with our team the last two years I was there. Uh, and she was, she was fantastic. Some guys are more like turned off to that and they're like, oh, I'm good. Like, yeah. you know, I've got my own, like, you know, mental approach and some guys, you know, found it useful, you know, and, uh, she was great. Do you guys have anything like that at Oregon? Yeah. Our strength and conditioning coach, Aaron Feld, um, who's now at Miami, he kind of handled everything like that. And I actually really enjoyed it because it, it did help a lot. But like you said, you know, some guys aren't aren't going to pay attention, but some guys are. So I feel like for the most part, it helped us. With a position like quarterback, uh, that's just you're taking in so much information and you're calling and you're communicating to so many guys. <laughs> bro, I hear you, you guys in the huddle. Bro, your calls are so long. <laughs> I struggled. I struggled for so long with that. Um, like I would spend it. Like every practice before Shane Day and I are, are working the calls and we're just memorizing and he'll test me and like it, it spends probably 20 or 30 minutes of our time, but like I have to do it because if I don't, then I, I'm going to go in there and mess up a play call. Yeah. So when our D court, I can't even imagine when it's loud in the stadium, like mm-hmm. we maybe have three, four, five words max to communicate to the huddle, but you guys, I look on the script and there's, it's like a couple sentences long. Like your rookie year, was there ever times you went in the huddle and you're like, I didn't get that? Like, There were a couple times early on when the headset would go out and you either have to, thankfully, the week of practice, you get to memorize all the calls. And so if you hear the first part, if you hear the formation, you You've know. You've heard it already. You're like, all right, I know the ending of this play. And so if you get the formation and it cuts out, you're like, all right, uh, you got to be quick on your feet and you're like, all right, this is the play that he wants. This is what I'm going to call. I'm going to go in there and call it. And whatever happens, happens. And, and sometimes it just go out and it goes out entirely. And so you have to make up a play call. And so I've got a few play calls that I know that I can get to. If like, there's a situation, mm. if it's like first and second down, it's really easy to just pl- call play and, you know, minimize the damage. If it's third down, you have to like really memorize, or maybe you have to call a timeout, find a way to, to get the play call in because it, it does go out sometimes. Yeah. Getting back to, like, the sports psych thing, like, I know at Notre Dame specifically, like, they were, the quarterbacks kind of had their own gig separate from the team just because, like I was saying, there's so much information to digest. Mm -hmm. It's a very, uh, you're just taking in a lot of information. Was that something uh, that they did with you throughout your process? Either Oregon or the Chargers have have tried to do, like, get extra mental training not too much individually you know i think at oregon everything was together we were all in the team room going through it together um and so there wasn't too much just on the quarterbacks but uh and i feel like we've we've definitely been given enough opportunities at the chargers um it's not like there's nothing uh, you know they give us opportunities if if you want something you can go get it and yeah we got dr herb and plenty of art plenty of resources so um you know i think everything's kind of together instead of individual though yeah so what was it like stepping on the scene in LA? Do you like that mic? Yeah, it's good. Sure, Mike. It's a nice mic. I like it. It's no, LA's quality. LA's been awesome. And um I throughout the, the entire draft process too, I, I kinda had my hopes and 
I didn't want to get too invested into the Chargers just because, you know, you don't have a whole lot of say, but I'm glad things worked out the way it did because this is what I wanted the entire time. Um, and obviously it's always tough when you lose a, a coaching staff and you wish it could have been different. But, uh, you know, the guys that we brought now, Coach Staley, this entire staff, um, you know, I think they've done an incredible job and, and I'm super thankful to be playing for them. Like coming in as such a high draft pick, I don't know that I've ever actually asked you this, but obviously uh, you came and replaced Phil, who had an incredible career and legacy with the Chargers. Did you guys ever have like any back and forth or have you ever spoken with him? Um, he's I'm, an off the map guy type. Too. I, he has no social. He's just coaching high school football. Simple guy. I've unfortunately only talked to him maybe once or twice. Um, you know, I, I know how busy he is and, um, you know, he's, he's got he's nine got, kids. He's got nine kids. And he's, he's coaching a high school football team. And, um, you know, I've just, I've been able to hear so many great Philip Rivers stories that he's a legend. And, and, you know, I grew up watching him and I was a Chargers fan and believe it or not, but, uh, you know, just to hear these stories and Scott Questenberry always tells me the greatest ones and, and Easton stick always has a bunch too. So, you know, it's great to hear from those guys. I remember I was a rookie and, it was like one of the first OTAs and you know how like as a rookie you have the locker like in the middle at least I had a locker in the middle of the locker room I didn't even have a a real locker I had a portable locker and I remember I was we had just wrapped up workouts and Phil comes out of the comes out of the shower man heading back to his locker and he goes out of his way and goes hi I'm Phil I just wanted to introduce I'm so glad you're here and I was like holy smokes man that's Philip Rivers he must have been in year probably 15 or 16 by then. It was 15 or 16. Another good film memory I had was, uh, did you ever play a drug dealer? Mm-mm. Like where you get the cards and you wink? No, but I I, yeah. I heard you guys talking about it, though. Yeah. Uh, Phil was a legend at that. He would always he would always stay late in the meal room and, like, play with, like, the rookies. I'm like, dude, what are you doing here? <laughs> Don't you have a wife to go call or kids to talk to? He'd what be hanging doing? with the boys. Yeah. Hanging with the youngsters. It's and huge. playing until the till the wee hours of the night. Um, what uh, I feel like you've gotten this question a million times, but like going into that game, game two, having no idea that you were going to start, what what was that moment like when Coach Lynn came to you and said, "Like you're up, buddy." I had absolutely no time to think about it, and that's which is probably which great. is great, yeah. But you weren't going to think about it anyway because that's what you do. Yeah, you don't no, think too but, much. Uh, I remember the entire week, Pep Hamilton, uh, our, our quarterback coach, loved working with him. And, and we kind of talked about it the entire time. Is You don't know when you're going to go in, but it's going to happen. A- at some point during that year, I was expecting to play. And it happened to be a little earlier than I was expecting. Week two, I, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't getting any first team reps. And so I had to kind of spend all my time after practice, before practice, walking through with Pep all the plays, you know, all the, all the calls. Um, and so I was ready, you know, I, I felt like I was ready to go in there. I knew the game plan. Um, and probably 20 seconds before kickoff, coach Lynn comes up to me, tells me I'm in. And I think that was another moment of like, are you sure? Like you want me to go play? And, and so he's like, yeah, like you need to go out there. So I, I went out there. Um, remember going out to the huddle, Hunter Henry, just hit me with the, what are you doing out here? And, and I said, like, hey, just here's the call. Like, let's go score. Like, don't even worry about it. And, and uh, yeah, I remember my first pass, actually, though, was to, to Keenan, and I sailed it over his head. I was just so excited to be out there. I just ripped it. And he came back to the huddle. I was like, sorry, Keenan. Like, that was my bad. He's like, you're good. You got it out of your system. So the next one I, we completed. But uh, it was definitely funny. What is it like in a offensive huddle? Like, for defense, it's guys are just – gassed out of breath and so it's basically just kind of like phone like you know you're just phone tagging yeah. like the call but like you guys are like in the huddle specifically as like a quarterback going in there like even maybe this last game versus the Raiders like I don't know like what are you what are you saying to the guys what's mm-hmm. that like is there is there typically a guy who's always the it, it kind of depends when so if it's early in a game and, and you're focused and like you're 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 close in a close game people are pretty focused and dialed in and, and you go in and um, honestly, I think one of the worst parts about the huddle is all the TV timeouts that we have. Yeah. And so we go up, stand out there for two minutes. And so I feel like someone needs to talk. And so sometimes I'll just talk and I'll just be like, I'll be like, Hey guys, like this is what we're going to do. We're going to go down score. Like, and I'll just fill the, fill the huddle with words just cause I hate silence. Um, but uh, if you're ever up in a game, like winning, 
I, it's really funny to be a part of. Like there are a lot of jokes and, um, you know, I think it's a great, great huddle that we have. The guys that we have in there, it's a great team. And no one's ever, you know, talking back to each other. Everyone's helping each other. And if someone doesn't get the call, the receivers are always good about communicating with each other and telling each other that, you know, this is what you have. And, um, you know, the running backs as well, they're always communicating with the offensive linemen. They've done a great job so far. Yeah. I feel like we should get to some of these mailbag questions. Uh, but first, <laughs> you've got a you've got a little golf invitational coming up, right? Mm -hmm. The Justin Herbert Invitational. I visited the website. It looks great. Yeah. I I'm probably, sure you had a lot of input into that design. I probably could have done a better job naming it. But, uh, you know, it is it is for a really good cause. Um, it's for kids sports, this youth sports organization in Eugene that I grew up playing. And so whether it's, you know, they host camps, um, sports clinics. They, they host, like, leagues, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, soccer, uh hockey i don't i don't know you know yeah talk, they do everything you guys play hockey and, and so i grew up and um you know it just gave everyone a, a chance to go play and, and compete and so for me to kind of help, help them you know continue that and whether it's scholarships equipment gear um doesn't matter they do great jobs for everyone so how if we wanted to support that do you just like visit the website and donate or what's the i guess what's the style is it like a like an auction style like is it a scramble tournament like what yeah, if there is a, a, a scramble tournament, there's an auction, um, you know, and I think it's a nonprofit organization that's always, um, you know, always needing s some sort of help to whether it's camps or whether they want to help out with clinics, things like that. But, uh, you know, if, you, if your golf game's ready, there's always an invitation for you. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, is there a is there a sports book that is associated that's putting odds on, on the winner? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I think because uh, my odds will be very low, but it could be a good bargain. You know, you could put probably five bucks and, and win a few well, thousand on me. You've got some, if I uh, happen to be, you know, on a good team. I yeah. Don't. Well, I don't know. I, I haven't uh, I haven't seen too much of your game, but I know that as an athlete, you're you're probably better than some of the guys that, that went last year. And so, you know, I've I've got high hopes. Such for as it. who? I don't want to say on here, but no, uh, dude, you got to say who's who was horrible at the at the outing. He wasn't horrible. I'm not gonna say he's horrible, but Jerry Tillery, he he I needs hope, to go to the range. I hope he hears this. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry and I always go at it, and uh, he has gotten a lot better. But uh, he's he's definitely a, a great guy to go golfing with, just because he's so funny. But in terms of actual golf quality, um, you know, we're always getting we're always getting better. He needs to go to the range. Uh, I don't know that there's too many ranges in Hawaii where, uh, yeah, where he, he's he got a nice spends most of his off time. He loves it out there. He loved it out there before he ever got to the NFL too. I remember him being at Notre Dame, and he would always talk about Hawaii, and he really enjoyed it. Hmm. All right. Uh, I'm I'm in here in the mailbag. There's uh there's quite a few responses, but one of the big ones is the brisket. Let's talk the brisket. Yep. Where uh I've actually been wanting to ask you this anyway because uh I really want an invite this season of course. to one of the brisket boy yeah bang outs. I don't yeah. care whose house it's at, but I want an invite. And uh what kind of got you on that? Yeah, is so that was that like growing up like pops? Yeah, so it kind of started with my grandfather. We were always big Traeger grills. Like, we always used Traeger to, whether it was ribs, chicken, steaks. Is that uh, not a newer grill? Has that just, has that been around? It's always been around. Like, I, I take a look at my grandpa's grill. It must have been, it's old. Like, it's an old grill that we still have. And so we, we kind of grew up using that. But, uh, so we were always on the grill. And, and so I lived with Gabe my first year. And we'd we'd won a game and we had a brisket in our freezer and you know we kind of just started out as a joke saying you know we're going to cook this brisket and it's a it's a victory brisket um and it was after the jacksonville jaguars game and unfortunately we got evacuated from our house because of fires um up in the hills that was a crazy time yeah out here and so we lost the brisket like it was just in the grill and we couldn't get back to the house because we had we had to get evacuated and so I, it was there Did it add to the fire <laughs> It must have been, you know, one of the, the most flavorful briskets of all time. But yeah. uh, it was unfortunately lost. And so Traeger sent another one. We won another game um, soon after. And it kind of just, we did it again. And so it kept going and we had guys over. And it was kind of like this, you know, this ritual after games. And so. I feel like Gabe tries to take uh, credit for cooking. No, you're shaking your head. He, uh, he's, he, I feel like I see him most often in the picture, mm -hmm. you know with the tools turning the yeah. meat 
I'm the one waking up at, at 2 a.m. putting it on and, and doing go. that stuff. So I, it was up to me, but he did help out a ton. So having him be a part of it was Are you was guys helpful. smoking? Like smoking the brisket? Yeah, so there's actually a bunch of recipes on Traeger that I kind of just follow. And, and I've kind of, early on, I started with that. But then as you know, the more you make, the, the better you get. So I kind of went off on my own here and there. But, uh, you know, there's a ton of recipes that are easy to follow. This, uh, let's see, Coach Chase. 814 says Twitter handle said ask what is your favorite brisket rub um that's a good question I actually used like the beef rub from Traeger they make their own individual spices and so I, I just felt it was really easy just to use those just so convenient and everything was already made um but you can start like experimenting with like they've got a coffee rub that you can start adding um you know, they've got a whole bunch of different seasonings that you can throw on there. Bollywood Herbert. This is one of those accounts. Probably why you don't have a Twitter. But uh, he's commenting on the the dunking videos. Mm-hmm. You see, you still got it? Yeah, but uh, my basketball is over after that. I unfortunately... That's one of the things that we talk about. Like, I love going to play basketball. I love just going to, to hang out with my friends. But, you know people will start recording videos of me playing basketball and I can't be doing that. I got to be more responsible than that. But that's what, why do you say that? It's, it, it's doesn't, not always a great It just look. doesn't look good. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I, you know, I've got a, a job here of playing quarterback and I need to be at my best. And so if anything bad would ever happen playing basketball, it'd be a, it'd be a bad look. And so I need to be my best. Yeah, but does that not stink for you? You love to play basketball. It's horrible. Yeah, I love basketball. I love being able to compete and showing up. Rec basketball is the greatest. It's awesome. Yeah. That's what I was trying to get to, I think, a little earlier, mm-hmm. though. Maybe to go back is, like, has being thrown into the stardom affected, like, your daily life in that way? And if so, is that, like, frustrating for you? It's affected my rec basketball for sure, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, those days are probably behind me, but... Uh, I guess it, it kind of opens doors to, to go play, like whether it's at my high school, Sheldon High School, like I know I can go play there. I can get guys to show up and play basketball there if I really wanted it. Um, but uh, I guess I just got to be smarter about going to the, the Oregon rec. Dude, I have a park right around the corner here, outdoor court. It's not indoor court, yeah, but Tanager Park, uh, pretty mellow, pretty quiet. Uh, other than the dog community, there's a lot of owners that take their dogs right in the field right there. Uh, but we could play some basketball. Yeah. I'm not good. Uh, but I like to compete. There are a few guys on the team that are pretty good. Keenan, uh, I've seen him play. Um, what style is he? Like a Steph? Is he like a a Ja? Like I'd give him a, a James Harden. You know, I think he's a really good scorer. He's a pretty good passer, and he's, he's got, got the put beard. Up yeah, and you give him the ball, something good's gonna happen. All right, uh, Stephen Gillard. Uh, maybe two more questions here before we wrap up. At any point during the draft, like the past two years, have you like been consulted or asked about certain like players or guys you like? They always offer the choice of me going up there and talking with them. I've always kind of told them like I believe in them. I I support their decisions no matter what. Um, and I. And I don't know if I can do the talent evaluation. I don't want to go in there and say like you know what I want this guy and. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know enough, unfortunately. And so I, I've always kind of left it to Tom Telesco and, um, you know, the rest of those guys upstairs because they've, you know, they're professionals at what they do and they've done an incredible job. So um, if they ever do have a question, I'd love to answer it, but uh, I kind of just let them do their thing. All right. Last one. Kyle said, I know it's only been two seasons, but what is your best NFL moment so far or your favorite, maybe favorite memories of a better way to put it? That's a good question. I, Did we just play footsies? Yeah, don't, foot? don't kick me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, there's uh, there's been so many. Like, there's been so many close games that that you win, especially this year, like the Kansas City game in week three. Awesome. Like, that was fun. That was really fun to be a part of. Um, you know, I think the Eagles game as well in Philadelphia when we drove down and Dustin Hopkins kicked that game-winning field goal. Um, I think even you go back to last year when we beat the Falcons, another game-winning field goal. Um, you know, there's just been a, a, a bunch of games that – you look back and you say hey, that was a lot of fun to be a part of. That was an intense game. Um, but uh, hopefully there's going to be many more. I even think of Washington week one. Yeah. 
where we get the ball and literally drive the ball for like seven minutes yeah. and run out the clock on what m- many people thought were, was going to be one of the best defenses in the NFL. And they still, they still are like to have those no guys doubt. up front, you know, that defensive line, that's, it's crazy. Their D line is stacked. Yeah. Well, the NFL, you, you play against those guys every week. Like it's, you never really have an off week and that's the tough part about it. That's awesome. Dude, I appreciate you doing this. It's been cool to hear about your roots uh, in Eugene all hey, the way to now, it, bro. You've got fun. the you've got the I don't know if I call that Oregon green. Yeah. But Oregon has so many shades of green that really anything works. Anything counts. Anything counts. Appreciate you. Thanks, Rue. I appreciate being on here. It's an honor. Glad I could help out. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. Thank you.